Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. Well, let's sit down on the path, said father. Everyone did it. Today, they were seeing off their older sister to the best city on earth. Carolyn was on her way to the capital to study law. She was coming from a small town of about 10,000 inhabitants, a large village where many people knew each other. Before, settlers didn't even close the doors, but now it's a bit scary. Carolyn graduated from high school with honors, so she only had one subject to pass, history. Her father drove her to the capital, it was a long way, 170 kilometers. Gregory intentionally went himself to give final instructions to his daughter. She was to stay with her aunt, her father's own sister, Fiona. She's not a bad woman, she's had a hard life, she'll tell you if she wants to. Study well, behave yourself, the capital is the capital. There are many temptations there. Don't drink alcohol. It makes people weak, speak unnecessary words and makes them do irreparable things. Also, never tell others too much about yourself. Remember that in moments of envy the blind begin to see, the dumb begin to speak, and the deaf begin to hear. Think before you do something, consult Fiona or call home. Don't go hungry, and dress warm. Carolyn had heard all this a hundred times before, but she was afraid of her father, so she listened and did not contradict him. Gregory had the character of Joseph's grandfather. He was a very stern man. Carolyn was a little girl and had heard that something had happened between Fiona and her father. Only no one wanted to talk about it. The father hugged his daughter, kissed her, wagged his finger, waited for the tail of the train to disappear around the corner and went home. For the first time, the 17-year-old Carolyn drove out of the small town alone. Looking at everything with her eyes wide open, she thought that a happy life was beginning for her, and it would be much more interesting than the previous one. She would be on the road for 25 hours, so, taking a book and an apple out of her bag, the girl immersed herself in reading. At short stops, her father said, it was not safe for her to get off. It was possible to miss the train. So she watched all the huge movement of people from the top shelf. The money was kept in a secret place, and on pain of death, it was not to be taken out of there until she reached Fiona. Soon she was there. What a lot of people, thought Carolyn. Auntie, give me some bread money, a boy about nine years old, with a dirty face and huge brown eyes, looked at her. She reached for the money, but remembered her father's command. Then, taking out a small purse with some bills in it, she decided to give some of it to the child. Before she could open the purse, she lost it. The barefooted boy snatched the money out of her hands and ran off in an unknown direction. Once in the big unfamiliar city, the girl felt lonely and lost. Everything around her was alien, people who didn't say hello to each other, houses, streets, and even the life that forced these people to hurry and talk on the phone on the go. She stood crying until Aunt Fiona came up to her. Why are you crying? She asked cheerfully. A boy snatched the money out of my hands and ran away. Was there a lot? No, but it's a pity all the same. Of course, it's a pity, you must keep attention in the capital, it's not your home village, where everyone knows each other. Yes, my father warned me, and I relaxed, and she began to be angry with herself again for forgetting all the precepts so quickly. Well, come on, don't cry, let's go home, get some rest, and the world will be a prettier and kinder place. The apartment that opened before her eyes was luxurious. It looked like a page out of a designer's catalog, expensive massive furniture, a bed covered with a satin bedspread, carved bedside tables with lamps standing on them, huge windows with beautiful curtains hanging on them. Am I in a fairy tale? asked Carolyn excitedly. What a fairy tale, my girl. Nothing has changed for a long time, it's all out of fashion already. Why change such beauty? Your place is so cozy and clean, Aunt Fiona. Daddy said you like cleanliness. Who doesn't love it? One seldom wants to sit in the dirt. Carolyn noticed the table set, a carafe of wine and plates. The tablecloth was snow white and she touched it with her hand and made sure it was starched. 
go take a shower from the road, and we'll sit down at the table and talk. Stepping out of the shower, the girl pulled gifts from her bag from home. Pickles and tomatoes, mushrooms, and strawberry jam. It smelled like home all at once, and covering her face with her palms, Fiona cried. That evening the two relatives sat at the table for a long time, and it was well past midnight when, wiping away their tears and cuddling, they went to bed. Carolyn could not sleep for a long time, she was under the impression of her aunt's story. Finally learning what had happened many years ago, the girl was surprised and amazed at her grandfather's cruelty. After emptying the decanter of wine, Fiona flushed, and as her father had said, the secret of the family was solved. Fiona herself began to tell the story. It had evidently been weighing on her soul for a long time. There were four of us in the family. Two boys and two girls. Anna and I were the youngest yearlings, Gregory was your father's second, and the older brother was Bob. Dad, Joseph, your grandfather, was very strict, even cruel at times, and Mom, Megan, your grandmother, was a very gentle and soulful woman. Father, of course, subjected her to himself. She was submissive, obedient, a good hostess, no one could bake pies better than her. When I finished eighth grade, a new boy came to our school. Such a handsome boy. He was into sports, his father was in the military. That's why they said they wouldn't stay here long. I fell in love with him in ninth grade. It was like I lost my mind. I started getting bad grades. My father was called to school, but he didn't beat me up, he just warned me. Look, Fiona, if you get pregnant, I'll kick you out. It would be a pity, you're still my daughter, but I'll spare you the shame. Do you remember? I nodded then, because I just wanted to love. We spent the whole ninth grade looking at each other, and at 10th grade, right in September, we started dating. Everyone was jealous of me. The guy was really great, his name was Ray. And on New Year's Eve, he invited me home. That's where it all happened. My father immediately noticed the change in me, only he could not imagine that his youngest daughter could disobey. And after winter break, the Ray family left. It was a tragedy. We said, goodbye, like I was seeing him off to the front. I cried, screamed, didn't want to let him go. He promised to write and call, but I still haven't received a single letter. In February it became clear that I was pregnant. I was very scared. What would I tell my family? I decided that I would finish school and then we would decide. I was very thin and my belly wasn't even visible. I passed my exams, got my diploma, and after the graduation party, my father called me over and looked me straight in the eyes and asked, Are you pregnant? Answering, yes, I even squeezed my eyes shut, but he quietly told me. Tonight pack your things, all your winter things too. Tomorrow morning I'll put you on the bus, I'll even give you some money, and I'm not interested in anything else. This is the life you have chosen yourself, so you can survive. How I cried. I asked for forgiveness, but he was relentless. Gregory stood up for me, but my father threatened him too. In the morning he gave me money and put me on the bus. I saw my mother running, but he stopped her and dragged her back home. From that moment on, she started getting sick. And I got a job at the factory. They gave me a dormitory, but my son was never born. I was hurrying to the streetcar, and from my height I fell on my stomach and lost consciousness. I don't know how long I lay there, but when I woke up in the hospital I realized that the baby was gone. When I came home, my mother was sitting in my room. Secretly from my father, she came to see me, bringing me money and groceries. You don't look well, daughter. I lost the baby. That's too bad. I could see my mother was sincere. No matter what your father says, I can't not see you, daughter. So I'll come as much as I can. And you call Tori again, she'll tell me everything. I could hardly hold back the tears. Mom didn't look well, she had gotten very old. She put her warm arms around me. How good I felt in her arms. What are you going to tell your father? I asked then. I don't know, daughter. I'll think of something. 
He doesn't have to know the truth at all, said my brave mother. She came back two months later. She looked even worse than before, but when our eyes met, we threw ourselves into each other's arms. I felt like a little Fiona, I wanted so much to be near my mother. Thank you for breaking out to me again. I miss you so much. I miss you too, honey. Maybe daddy will forgive me now and let me come home. Mom shook her head. No, Fiona, he won't change his mind. He's stubborn and has worn everyone out with his temper. As I said, goodbye, I asked my mother, will you come again? Of course, darling, don't even doubt it. I kissed her on the cheek, and she disappeared out the door. For a year my mother came to see me, and those were the happiest moments of my life. I found out later that my father used to give her scandals, guessing that my mother was coming to see me. Joseph, it's been a while. Let her come home already. How much more can you do? Especially since she doesn't have a child. What daughter are you talking about? Don't play dumb, I'm talking about Fiona. We don't have such a daughter and never have enough about that, the father replied with a furrowed brow. The conversation ended, and the father's stony heart didn't even waver. And a month later my neighbor, Tori, came to see me. Megan is not well at all, try to repent, maybe father will let me see her. After saying, goodbye, she left, and I hurried home the next day. All sorts of thoughts came into my head. But I had to get into the house and see my mother. What if she dies? My father can't forbid me to see her. I ran from the bus stop to the house, but I was in such a hurry. When I entered the house, I could feel my heart beating. Mom was almost there, but my father, when he saw me, even paid attention and said nothing. I came to see mother, I said in a trembling voice. My brothers were silent, Anna was crying. No one objected to my father. Forgive me, Papa, I tried to go for reconciliation. I don't have such a daughter, and your mother is dying. It was you who shortened her life with your promiscuous behavior. I want my mother. This is my home, too, and you have no right to do this. She loves me. How can you love someone who is long gone? Go away. You should have thought of that when you were spreading your legs for a guy, and now your mother doesn't need you. You're very cruel, father, if mother finds out you didn't let me in, she won't forgive you. And I won't forgive you now. And I don't need your forgiveness, he slammed the door. I felt like I was in some horrible dream. My father didn't know what he was doing. The man was overwhelming everyone, making everyone afraid. I did not understand how to behave with my own father. He had brothers, but none of them had even a fraction of his toughness and that certainty that he was right. He had a strong trait, if he cut someone out of his life, it was for good. The tears wouldn't stop flowing. I didn't want to leave, so I went to Tori's for the night. And in the morning, mom was gone. That's it, I said to myself then, I'm an orphan. My father had been gone a long time, but my mother was gone only today. I watched the funeral from the side, but I was afraid to go near it. I didn't want to cause a scandal at such a sad event. I went to mom's grave when everyone else had gone. How long I stood there, I don't know. But it started to get dark, and I hurried to the bus. In the evening, when I was already home, I thought about everything that had happened to me since that moment when my life had turned to hell. I had a lot to think about, a lot to realize, because I would soon be twenty, and I had nothing, no education, no family, not even a place of my own. I paid a very high price for a love that was not mutual. It is a great feeling for which we make sacrifices. I tried to make the man I loved happy, and I became the unhappiest person in love. And I know for a fact that Ray didn't appreciate my sacrifice. And now the loss of my mother meant that I had no one left. After my father's betrayal and the loss of my mother, I broke down. I had gone from a young woman taking care of herself to a shadow that was not happy about anything. I dreamed of getting out of this depression and going to the most beautiful city in the world, to achieve something to make my mother proud of me. 
Aunt Fiona, I'm so sorry, cried Carolyn, I didn't think my grandfather was so cruel. I found out later that he was cheating on my mother. When my brothers voiced their grievances to him, sticking up for my mother, he would tell them, get married, you'll understand me. If the wife is sick all the time, what's a man to do? It's as simple as that. Lifelong fidelity is the ideal that everyone strives for. It is worth a lot of effort. At all times constancy was worth its weight in gold, and grandfather was not one. They were an ordinary family, they rarely quarreled, but now I understand the reason. His wife always yielded to him, and he felt he was the master. My mother always wanted me to study, so I made a commitment to get a higher education, find a good job and be happy. That's what my mother wanted. I wasn't afraid to go to the capital. After my mother died and confronted my father, I was no longer afraid of anything. The little girl grew up and was sure that she would succeed. I graduated from the Institute of Light Industry by correspondence, got a job in a small atelier, and then, when a new director came there, he turned this small atelier into a fashion house and made the simple seamstress his wife. We lived with Nathan for a happy five years. Those were the best years of my life. I felt beautiful, loved and the happiest. Can you imagine, he got sick when he was speaking at a meeting. Grabbing his heart, he wobbled and collapsed. The ambulance came quickly, but there was no one left to save him. A massive heart attack. I realized that shouting to everyone how happy you are being is dangerous. You should thank the person who gives you that happiness. And I wanted everyone to know how happy I am and how much I love. And happiness loves silence. Did you come to your grandfather's funeral? I wanted to, but he warned everyone not to have me around his coffin. Then I went to his grave with my mother. I cleaned up, left flowers, and left. Then, a year later, I came to my parents' house, which had changed a lot. You either have to speak well of the dead, or nothing but the truth. So, if you tell the truth, everyone's faces became different, everyone began to live without looking back at this tyrant. After all these years, I got my family back again. Only I wish my mommy was gone. If someone else had told me this story, I wouldn't have believed it, Carolyn said quietly, I'm sorry. All right, niece, go get some rest, and kissed her on the top of her head, I just remembered everything and told you, and I feel better. Falling asleep almost in the morning, Carolyn didn't get up until lunchtime. Fiona had already left for work, and pancakes with strawberry jam and coffee were waiting for her in the kitchen. Breakfast didn't take long, and after quickly putting her papers in her purse, she headed to the university. Oh. Great students. Said with admiration to the girl who was accepting the papers, we need students like that. Only now, when she saw that huge, beautiful building, did she realize how grandiose it was. Am I really going to study here, the girl thought. All the days that remained before the exams, she honestly studied books, looked at maps, tried to live up to her title, a medalist. X day came. Students crowded around the auditorium, on the door of which was written history exam, and were afraid to go in first. Carolyn boldly opened the door and asked permission to enter. Young lady, your courage is enviable, the history teacher said with a smile. Thank you, to be honest, but my knees are shaking, the professors on the committee looked at each other, surprised at such directness. Pull the ticket. My hands weren't shaking. There was no more excitement. Everything had been learned. Looking at the ticket, the instructor grimaced, get ready. You can go to the cards. They'll help you. I'm already ready. Even so? You're so cocky. It's just that I know this ticket. Oh, well. We'll see. She talked for a long time. You bet. So much extra material studied. By the end of her story, the committee members were looking at her with great amazement. Well, you really know the ticket, well done. Take your time, John, now we'll see how much of her knowledge is true. There were three additional questions. Carolyn did well with the first, but the second and third were a little confused. 
So when the grade was announced, she heard that she got a B, although the committee had mixed opinions on this. But the chairman supported one of the teachers, and the grade of a 4 was final. For Carolyn, a I-4 was comparable to a 2. It meant that she had failed in her medal status and would have to take all the subjects for which she was much worse prepared, hoping for an 5 in history. All night long the girl cried, and no amount of persuasion from her aunt could work on her. After passing all the exams and scoring 16 points, she failed the competition. What are you going to do, the aunt asked regretfully, are you going home? No, Aunt Fiona, I'll get a job and study. If I don't get in next year, I'll go home and work at the school as a cleaner. Why, there's probably never an honors student mopping the floors. It's funny, she cried. I'd take you to work for me. No, I can't sew, and I don't like it very much. If only to wash the floors. What are you getting attached to these floors? There are plenty of people who want to work there without you. I'll have to think about it. Why don't you rest till Monday, see the town, and I'll try to think of something. The first thing Fiona thought of was getting her a job as a secretary at some law firm. Carolyn would have gained some experience, she was used to the capital. But her aunt couldn't get her anything. No one wanted yesterday's schoolgirls who didn't know secretarial work. The week was coming to an end, and Carolyn felt she would have to go home. Lynn, I met an acquaintance of mine today, he and Nathan were great friends, he had an accident a year ago, his wife was killed in a car accident, and his son was hurt too, but it seems his legs have been operated on and he is walking, but his eyes, which have already had two operations, can't see yet. Anyway, he's looking for a nurse for his son. He fired a woman a week ago. My son complained that she was yelling at him and he thought she was going through drawers. I certainly don't like that idea very much. Why not? It's a job like any other. Am I allowed to work there? It confuses me that you have to live there. Live there? Why? Because Samuel Davis works a lot, comes in late, and the kid needs constant care. And do they have a big apartment? Fiona smiled when she heard that question. He has a huge house, a staff of servants. You'll only have to take care of Austin. And when do you have to give an answer? Samuel will call tonight. I don't want to live there either. Fine, we'll find something else, Fiona said with a hug from her niece. Samuel, as promised, called around 10 in the evening. Fiona, what have you decided? No, Samuel, she doesn't want to live with you, find someone else braver. Fiona, let's make a deal. Have her come tomorrow and start work, and I'll have my chauffeur drive her home and bring her back in the morning. It's very inconvenient for me, of course, but at least I'll have time to find someone else. All right, I'll come with her, she doesn't know the capital very well, and she'll feel safer with me. That's fine. I'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Now all her thoughts were on tomorrow. She lay there, hypnotizing the clock, but the hands crawled so slowly that she sometimes thought they were standing. But at exactly 7 a.m., she was awakened by Fiona. Get up, they're waiting for us, we have more breakfast to eat. They pulled up to the Davis house 15 minutes early. Seeing the huge three-story house, Carolyn was amazed. She had seen them on television with the oligarchs. She was surprised by the beautifully trimmed trees in the shape of spheres, the flowers in the fanciful flower beds. Everything spoke of skillful hands and the love that went into everything she saw. A huge grand staircase led up to the second floor. But she and Fiona stopped on the first floor and waited for the master. What's he like, thought Carolyn, serious, fat, maybe even bald. He's the same age as my father, after all. A tall, tanned man of athletic build, wearing jeans, a short stylish haircut made him look very young, came jogging down the stairs. His whole appearance suggested that the owner of this body was working hard at it and, if one could lift his polo, all six cubes on his abs came into view. The man was very attractive, one could only guess how many women's hearts would want to break through to his hot body. Carolyn caught herself thinking that she wasn't thinking about that at all, which was completely out of character for her. 
But the closer Samuel came, the faster the blood rushed through her entire body. Hello, Fiona. And who is this beautiful creature? The girl looked amazingly alive and real, she did not yet realize the impression she could make on men. That was the secret of her attractiveness. No one ever thought she was stupid. At almost 18, she understood a lot and was a rare combination of cute looks and a smart head. Hello. I'm Carolyn. Hello, beautiful child. Shall we go and meet Austin? Yes, of course. I'm just a little nervous. You shouldn't be. No one will hurt you here. He's a nice guy, just as long as he needs the attention, the help of another person. But I really hope that the third operation will help him become independent. While they were talking they made it to Austin's room. Samuel knocked and entered only when he heard, come in. The door opened noiselessly, revealing to the girl's gaze a subtle young man. Very much like her father, only more frail. Austin, you will have another nurse from today. Who, the young man asked, rising from the couch. Carolyn boldly walked up to Austin, took his hand and said, I'm Carolyn, let's be friends, it'll make it easier for us to get along. The young man cracked a smile, showing dimples on his cheeks and asked, Can I call you Lynn? I like that name, but if you don't mind. Lynn, the girl repeated, as if tasting the new name, why, I like it too. No one's ever called me that before, you'll be the first. Can I give you a hug? Carolyn turned to Fiona and Samuel, looking to them for support. Fiona nodded, and the girl hurriedly replied. Sure, she said, and hugged Austin. Samuel, she turned to her host, I would like to know the front of my duties. Carolyn, remember, you are not a maid. You are not supposed to keep Austin's room clean, there are special people for that. You are not supposed to cook his meals, others do all that. You have to walk with him, read to him if he asks, help him eat, give him pills, help him get dressed. It would be good if you knew how to give injections, because the nurse only comes in the morning, and he needs one more injection in the evening. The previous nurse was a good nurse, but a disgusting person. I'm looking for a caregiver with a medical degree. I don't have such an education, but I know how to give injections, because I went to medical school. I used to give injections to everyone at home, so if you're not afraid to trust me with your son, I can fill in for the nurse in the evening. Great, that's what we'll do. Nancy will be here now to give the injection, you'll give your first injection under her supervision. If Nancy says it's right and you can be trusted with this serious matter, then you'll give Austin the injection tonight before you leave. Dad, why before you go, isn't Lynn going to live with us? No, son, she won't, and I can't make her, and she's with us temporarily until I can find a good nurse for you. The girl noticed how sad the boy became. But she couldn't stay the night in a total stranger's house and with strangers. Her father would consider it an inconsiderate thing to do. The atmosphere, while Carolyn was showing off her nursing capabilities, was tense. Nancy looked at the girl with a frown, defiantly resentful of the fact that she was looking for a replacement. Samuel watched the manipulation of Carolyn's hands closely. He was not at all interested in Nancy's displeasure, all he cared about was that his son was getting everything the doctor had prescribed. So after making sure Carolyn was doing everything right, he rejoiced. So, Nancy? Don't you think it's dangerous to entrust your son to a girl? Well, I don't know, Samuel. I wouldn't take any chances if I were you, the nurse said with a smirk. Did she do it right? I think so. If you'd send a car for me, I could come to Austin a second time. I don't see the need for that, I'm looking for a caregiver with a medical background. She'll do both injections, and you'll finally be free. Nancy did not share his enthusiasm. Moreover, she felt more resentful than ever, as if she had been dipped in something unpleasant with her head. Carolyn looked at her and had to admit that the girl was pretty. Her short stature, wavy black hair, and fluttering blue eyes under a fan of thick lashes made her very touching. She looked a little older than Carolyn. The robe she wore fit tightly around all the curves of her beautiful figure. In the new girl Nancy felt threatened by her far-reaching plans. 
Samuel was clearly high on her status, but Austin treated her well. She had literally tamed him, and he appreciated that attitude. Of course, Carolyn had no idea of Nancy's plans, but the fact that she was getting nervous, not hiding her emotions, worked against her. Maybe she should have reassured the nurse that Carolyn had no pretensions to Austin, but somehow she didn't want to do that at all. Samuel was rarely harsh, but when he was, it was hard to get him off course. This same character trait was passed on to his son. So once again he asked Nancy to come until he could find a new nurse. All the days that followed, Nancy was in anticipation of a call from Samuel. She hypnotized the phone, hoping that he would call, apologize, and send a car for her. Sometimes there was a great urge to go over and tell her father everything, how she felt about Austin, and how she really felt about him. She wanted to tell him that she had fallen in love with him a long time ago, but the fear that she might lose everything and her pride prevented her from coming up and just confessing. So, after saying, goodbye, she walked proudly out of the room, cursing this Carolyn, who had messed up all her plans. For some reason, she thought it would be easy to make the younger Davis fall in love with her. Nancy knew her worth. Not everyone had access to such a beautiful body. Here you have to give her credit, the beauty was choosy, though she saw the reaction of men to her person. Almost every one of them considered it a blessing to be allowed to give a gift or take her to a restaurant. Nancy never stooped to going door to door to get an injection in the heel. But upon learning that Austin's father was young, rich, and a widower, she immediately agreed, fearing someone would be quicker and take away such a tidbit. For almost a year she courted Austin, but he somehow didn't respond to her at all. And about a month ago, he asked her to stick around after his injection. At first they chatted and laughed for a long time, she sat down on his couch, took his hand, and he reached out to her with the urge to kiss her. A real, grown-up kiss. A little shy at first, and then, bravely, pressed against her, literally depriving her of air. Wished that this kiss would not end, she would have liked to stay with him, here and now, allowing him more, but he stopped and apologized for his intemperance for a long time. Nancy, as a medical professional understood, a guy in his twenties and young energy finding no outlet, so she reassured him. Come on, don't apologize. First of all, I understand everything, and second of all, I liked it. You're a great kisser. That's great. It cost her some effort to pull a smile at a bad game. But the thought of finishing what she had started stayed with her. When she saw Carolyn, a young and pretty girl, she got excited, but then she thought that the girl wasn't her competition. It was just her jealousy of Austin that finally clouded her mind and turned her into a bitch. Real nonsense, she told herself, I'm beautiful and sexy and experienced, and this girl from the village, though pretty, is still very young. After calming down a bit, she finished everything Samuel had asked her to do and left the house. Fiona and Samuel left for work, leaving Carolyn with her ward. Let me show you the house so you know where everything is. They held hands and walked down to the first floor. I've lived in this house since I was five years old. When I walked in and saw this huge house, my parents told me later that I raised my head and put my palms to my cheeks and said, oh, oh. What a palace. Does the Sultan live here? I was amazed at the size of it. I too, when I walked in, was shocked by such beauty. The chandelier looks like a frozen waterfall, and how beautifully it shimmers with multicolored lights. This chandelier was ordered by my parents in Italy. All the pendants on it are white, and since each one has many facets, they take on a different color from the lamps. Oh, wow. Wow, I've never been in a house like this in my life. I've only seen it on TV and in movies. Well, in general. They won't believe who I tell, exclaimed Lynn enthusiastically, not letting go of Austin's hand for a moment. If you want to read, on the right is the library and next door is Daddy's office. Beyond that are the rooms of the employees who live with us. Austin guided her around the house. He navigated perfectly, remembered everything, what, where it was. He introduced her to the house helpers. It was evident that they all treated him very well. If you had agreed to live with us, your room was next to mine. But daddy told me not to push you. 
she followed the turn of Austin's head. Lynn, there's a portrait of a woman hanging there. Yes, it's huge and the woman is gorgeous. That's my mother, Loretta. Beautiful, isn't she? Very. Such kind eyes and the same mole on her cheekbone as yours. Is she Italian? Yes, she and daddy met when he was vacationing there. My Italian grandparents didn't want to let her go with daddy to another country. But she fell in love with daddy and followed him. It's impossible not to fall in love with him, Carolyn thought. And when she died, they wanted to take the ashes back to Italy, but daddy wouldn't give them up, so then they asked for at least a part to bury her in her native land. Listening to Austin's story, the girl looked the whole time at the portrait, but when she heard the young man's voice tremble, she turned and saw tears in her eyes. Austin, don't tell me anymore, I understand how hard it is for you, how bad it is to be without your mother. But you still love her, and she feels it. Lynn didn't know how to distract Austin from her heavy thoughts. Look, why don't we go for a walk? Come on, you can tell me about yourself. I have a brief biography so far. But I'm still interested. Walking on the property, the girl told me that she had come from a small town to apply to a metropolitan university for law school. You want to be a lawyer? Why, does that surprise you so much? No, you and I are just colleagues. I finished my freshman year, passed all my exams without a C, and then I couldn't study any further. Wow, Lynn wondered, let's get ready little by little, me for admission and you for continuing your studies? They walked for a long time, riding on the swings, laughing, and talking a lot, until they were called to lunch. After lunch Austin asked her to read. Get something from the library, something of adventure. I don't feel like reading any serious books right now. The day flew by quickly, at 7 p.m. sharp, after giving him an injection, Lynn began to say, Goodbye. I'm going to go, Austin, it's late. I'll see you again tomorrow morning. Thank you Lynn, I've had fun with you. Me too. Walking out the gate, she saw Samuel's car. Are you leaving already? The man asked. Yes, it's time, see you tomorrow. There was no way she could look him in the eye, timid in front of him, like a schoolgirl in front of a strict principal. This new feeling, completely unknown to her, frightened her. It shouldn't be like this. It was wrong, abnormal. He is much older, though he looks fine. I get lost being around him. Some kind of horror. It's a good thing no one in this house can read other people's minds, because something unimaginable is going on in my head. When I arrived at their house, I tried to be a little late, so that my father could leave in time to go to work. It was amazing, he didn't seem to be doing anything, but it was turning me over inside. Then there was the occasional touching. He probably likes to watch me embarrass myself. He'd pat me on the shoulder or hold my hand, and I wouldn't know what to do. For a girl from a small town, he was a prince from a fairy tale, a strong man who solves all problems. Everybody must like men like that, thought the girl, each time she drove away from the Davis house. The week during which Carolyn visited Austin was coming to an end. They had become friends, both enjoying being around each other. Their common interests and goals united them and made their pastime rewarding. Samuel, coming in from work on Friday, announced that Carolyn could stay off work from Monday, he had found a good caregiver. Thank you so much for helping us out, and handing her a thick envelope, he continued, this is for your excellent work. The girl's face changed, her gaze became sad and, ignoring the envelope that was handed to her, she said regretfully, so you don't need my services anymore? Samuel looked at her and shook his head. Good. Thank you, I'm glad I got to know you. Bye. Austin, and without taking money, she ran down the stairs. Carolyn, you forgot the money. I don't need it. Samuel ran after her and taking her hand quietly said, every job must be paid for. You've done a wonderful week and you deserve this money. Take it and thank you very much. She looked at Samuel with eyes full of tears, but he was calm, composed, focused. His gaze was direct, open. He looked unashamed, but not brash. 
The man was used to being the master of the situation, used to be in charge of the firm, of people, of emotions. Accustomed to separating the personal from the business. And Carolyn's emotions took over, and she couldn't stop them. I was very comfortable with you, you are good people, thank you for the money. Now that's another thing, Samuel said happily, say hello to Fiona. Should I come on Saturday and Sunday? After all, Austin has to get his injections. No, Carolyn, those particular injections are over, there are other injections, and a different caregiver starting Monday. Got it. She finally found the strength to get in the car. There were no more questions, which meant it was no longer appropriate to detain Samuel. After waving him, goodbye, the girl turned away. Austin was upset, too. Turning back against the wall, the boy didn't want to talk to his father. Son, what's wrong? His father asked again without seeing any response, Austin, am I waiting for an answer? Why did you fire her? I felt so good with her. I even felt like I could see. She's wonderful, smart, I think she's beautiful, kind. Did you know that she graduated with a gold medal from high school? We had so much fun together. First of all, she didn't want to work here herself, and second. Not to work, but to live. Do you feel sorry for her to be brought to us? What difference does it make? She does injections better than Nancy. I don't even notice and ask her if she's done. Call her and tell her to come in on Monday, I don't need anyone else. Samuel went down to the kitchen to talk to those who had Austin and Lynn in front of them all day. She's a good girl, said the housekeeper, Austin's even eating better. What do you mean he's eating better? I missed something. Can you tell me more? Because if he refused, Lynn would also push back her plate, adding that she was very hungry but wouldn't touch anything without him. And today he asked for more himself. They became very friendly. She tells him something all the time, she won't leave his side, and I haven't seen him this cheerful in a long time. Excuse me, Samuel, maybe I'm meddling, but as a mother of three, your son needs emotional support. Those nurses are babysitting him and he's sad, and Lynn has brought him back to life. He's started to believe that everything is going to be okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, Samuel replied and went into his office. He was about to call Fiona to bring Carolyn back, but there was a knock on the door. Samuel already knew who it was. Only she could knock so melodiously. Without waiting for an answer, the door opened. The man was not mistaken. She came up behind him, wrapped her arms around his neck and biting a little on his earlobe, she asked, How are you? The man stood up abruptly. I asked you not to do that. Never. But. No buts, and walked out of the office. Meanwhile, Fiona was figuring out the reason for her niece's bad mood. Carolyn, what happened? Samuel fired me. He said he didn't need my services anymore. Well, that's right. You yourself only agreed to work for a week and didn't want to live there. Did he find another nurse after all? Yes, there will be another one starting Monday and with accommodations. I don't understand, what do you want? I want to work there. What all of a sudden? Why such a change? Carolyn herself didn't know why she was drawn there. Or rather, she guessed. She should have admitted at least to herself by now that she liked Samuel. Knowing that this was wrong, she couldn't tell her aunt about it. Having calmed down a little after visiting a relative, Samuel realized that it was too late to call Fiona and postponed the conversation until tomorrow. And Carolyn, being a little sad, took the newspapers and began to look for a job. She got up early in the morning and went to the addresses. A small law office needed a courier, but she noticed a pregnant girl in the secretary's position, and she smiled and said, I'll have a spot open in a month, do you want to take it? They won't take me, I don't know how to do anything. Well, you're not stupid, we'll teach you. Take your documents and come back, I'll tell you all the tricks of the trade. And if the director won't take me? I'll ask him if he has anyone in mind, and if he doesn't, he will. 
Carolyn hadn't had that kind of luck in a long time. It took her a little longer than she was supposed to take her papers, she just didn't know the city very well yet, but that was fixable. She got home late that day. She was in a great mood and from the doorway she shouted out, Fiona, I've got a job, and I'll probably be working as a secretary in a month, so I won't be hanging on your neck. What are you so worried about my neck? The money you earned from Samuel, I put in your account. You're going to need it. You need to get new clothes, you need to buy a phone, I'm worried about you. You don't know the city, so the phone is our first purchase. One more thing. Samuel called. My heart went in my heels. Why? Inviting you back to Austin. He says everyone there is crazy about you, especially Davis. Why don't you say something? Can you hear me? I hear you, of course, Carolyn replied, smiling. What do you say? No. I won't go back to them. Lynn, I don't understand you. Yesterday you roared that you wanted to go back to them, and today they ask you to go back themselves. You categorically say no. What happened? She walked over to her aunt, hugged her. I can't go there, it's not right, I really like Samuel. I realize he doesn't want me, but I'm afraid to hear it from him. He's a well-to-do grown man, and he should have a beautiful, elegant woman by his side, but not some simpleton like me. I want a simpler man, of course, a family, children, like my parents. Oh, my girl. Samuel drives a lot of women crazy. It's hard to walk past such a handsome man and not notice him. But his wife's own sister, Charlotte, has been in love with him ever since Loretta and Samuel met. This spoiled parent girl could say anything to her older sister, up to and including the fact that she wasn't right for him, and she was able to decorate his life. She behaved disgustingly at the wedding. She came to the funeral with her parents, but she refused to leave, saying that she would stay for a month to support Samuel, and she lived for the second year and wreaks havoc on his nerves, wanting to get him into bed. But he's tough, doesn't give in, and waits for her to get tired of it. That's why you made the right decision not to go to them. She's so confrontational, she might hit you. Wow, I didn't know that. At that time the phone rang. It was Samuel. Yes, honey, I'm listening. What do you think, Fiona? Samuel, I can't give you any good news. She got a job and won't go anywhere. Put her on the phone. Here, talk to him yourself. Hello, Samuel. How's Austin? He's waiting for you. Would you change your mind? No, Samuel, I'm going to college, and I'll be working as a secretary in a law office, learning a lot for my future profession. I see. Maybe then we can arrange for you to come visit him on Saturday and I'll drive you to work on Monday morning. She wanted so much to see the man again, to be near him, to talk to him. After thinking about it for a while, she agreed. All right. For the sake of Austin's mood, I'll visit him on the weekends. Thank you very much, I'll pay you well for that. No money for me, I'll come to you as a vacation home, what money? That's out of the question. You'll have the car on Saturday at about 11 o'clock. Okay. Hi Austin. Thanks, Lynn. She kissed Fiona. I'm lucky, after all, he invited me. Silly you, be careful and remember he invited you to his son. Well auntie, you've ruined everything. Opening the doors, Samuel stood with a charming smile and watched Lynn. He liked this girl. She was humble, open, all natural, no grimaces or desire to be liked. Very pretty. Girls like that tend to make men feel protective and it was nice. I'm glad to see you at our place. Lynn. At the edge of the steps stood Austin. Careful, you're on the very edge, and she ran toward the young man. He hugged her and Lynn blushed. She felt good and easy with this guy, as if they had known each other for years. Come on, I have a lot to tell you, he pulled the girl to his room. Samuel sighed, thank God she agreed. And indeed, Austin transformed himself, 
put on a nice shirt and, most importantly, he was in a great mood. Saturday night was nearing its end when Lynn, after wishing Austin good night, left the room. Carolyn, come on down, it was Samuel, let's sit by the fireplace. He put two cups of fragrant tea on the table, got out a very large box of chocolates and a vase of fancy cookies. Help yourself, the tea is from India, the candy is from Switzerland, and the cookies are from Arzina. I think they taste the best. The tea was indeed fragrant, the candy was delicious, but the cookies were over the top. They drank tea like old acquaintances and Lynn looked at him with such sincerity, catching every word he said. The quiet music was conducive to conversation. Would you accept me into your company, Charlotte asked quietly as she crept in. Finally, Lynn was able to get a good look at her. A burly brunette with thin lips, a pointed little nose, and eyes that were very prickly, looking suspicious. Why are you quiet, am I interrupting your conversations? Carolyn was silent, thinking she had no right to interfere, she was a guest, let the host speak. No, I'm not interrupting, sit down to tea, and I'm going to bed. So you are interrupting after all, the woman shouted angrily. As the door to Samuel's bedroom closed, Charlotte's prickly gaze shifted to Lynn, don't you dare flirt with him, she hissed, he's mine. If you want to continue to be in this house, know your place. You're a caregiver, remember. Tea drinking is the owner's business, she spoke very emotionally, in Italian quickly, waving her arms, replacing in some places. Do you want me not to come to this house? That would be perfect. All right, I'll tell Samuel tomorrow that I can't go to his house because you don't want me to, and she had already turned to leave, but Charlotte, realizing the horror of what she said, yanked Lynn sharply on her sleeve. Don't you dare say that to him, or else. Don't yell at her, they suddenly heard Austin's voice. Samuel jumped out of the bedroom. What's wrong? Austin, why aren't you asleep? Dad, she's yelling at her. Okay, I get it, go to bed. You too Carolyn, go to your room. And you come here, and, grabbing Charlotte by the elbow, he dragged her into the study. Right in front of her he called his Italian mother-in-law and father-in-law, good evening. Didn't you miss your daughter? I understand your sarcasm, his father-in-law replied, so we're waiting for her whether we miss her or not. I hear you, I'll get her a ticket tomorrow and call you back, and they said, goodbye. I think you've been overstaying your welcome in this house, a month stretched out for a year or more. Absolutely everything about her was unnerving and stressful. With Charlotte coming into their lives, no matter what he did, no matter what his head was occupied with, he kept coming back to the idea that it was time for her to go to Italy. I didn't want to be rude to you, for the sake of Loretta's memory, but you don't know the measure, so I'm speaking plainly. I am not interested in you as a woman, but as a human being, I dislike you. I don't want you in my house. I'm sorry, Samuel, I love you too much and can't see any woman near you. Where did you see a woman? She's a child, she's not even 18 yet. I won't change my mind, you're flying home and you can only come visit me with your parents. That's it. I'm going to bed. He couldn't, just wasn't able to tolerate her in his house. He just imagined her in his bed, and everything inside shrank into a lump and began to feel nauseous. Two sisters, from the same father and the same mother, and so different. His Loretta was very modesty, gentleness, sincerity and Charlotte is jealous, mean and horribly spoiled. If you can hear me now, he turned to Loretta, forgive me and understand, she makes the servants groan, she makes me and my guests sick. I love you, said the man. In the morning Samuel booked a ticket to Italy. The plane was leaving at night. Pack up, the plane's tonight, I'll take you. I'm not going anywhere, I'm staying. Okay, just not at my place. I'll take you to a hotel, pay for the day, and then I'll do it myself. You're cruel, Samuel, I'm your wife's own sister after all. Exactly just your sister, and you act like your wife. She called her parents, who supported Samuel and told him to fly home. He calmed down when he saw the plane in the sky, sighed and crossed himself. And on Sunday, Samuel had lunch right outside. The main course was grill. 
Autumn had come into its own, so everyone was warmly dressed and the hot tea was making everyone's mouths water. The mood was great, and Austin was especially happy, telling all sorts of funny stories from his short college life. Apparently, it's going to rain, Samuel said as he looked at the frowning clouds. Lynn shivered and thought of the warm chair by the fireplace, are you leaving tomorrow? asked Austin sadly. Yes, I'm working now. Next time I'll tell you how I'm doing. Waking up early on Monday, she didn't want to wake Austin, but he was already standing outside his room to say, goodbye, to Lynn. I'll be waiting for you, and, daringly, he drew her to him to kiss her on the cheek. Don't miss me, the girl said and rushed down the stairs. Winter crept up unnoticed. It snowed at the end of November and the carved fluffy snowflakes gently touched her face and melted. The road was snowing so fast that even the machinery couldn't cope with this beautiful natural phenomenon. Carolyn had already been working as a secretary for a month. It was very difficult at first, and inside she had serious doubts about giving it all up and going home. She was always welcomed and loved there. She missed her home, her parents, treacherous tears came to her eyes, her nose began to sting, and she was ready to give up. But her natural stubbornness, the firmness of character, which did not combine with her angelic appearance, did not give her the chance. And she stormed through computers, documents, learning to talk to people. And things moved forward. Now she liked everything, the staff, the director, the visitors, with whom at first she was afraid to enter into controversy, but now she even dared to give advice. There is a condition in our contract with you, where an acceptance certificate for services rendered must be drawn up, Carolyn said, this is an important point, that's why it was included in the contract. We've done everything on our end, and you haven't, was the conversation Wilmer Deer's director overheard. He was justifying his colorful last name. The man had everything under control, nothing without his decision was valid, which was probably why the firm was in perfect order. Well done, Carolyn, you see they don't give out gold medals in our schools for nothing after all. And you were five minutes late for work today. That's not good. Where do you live? I'm staying with my aunt. Who's the aunt? Fiona Clark. Fiona? The model house? Yes. My spouse adores her. When Nathan was alive, we used to get together a lot. Fiona really helped us out once. Our unfortunate crazy sister-in-law ran off before the wedding with some Turk, and the dress was already made. I don't understand much about your outfits, but when I saw it, I was blown away. It was a work of art. And it cost a lot of money, and Wilmer rolled his eyes, we didn't know what to do with that dress, and Fiona didn't want to set her up for such a sum. But she offered to keep it with her. And a week later she called and returned the advance and the dress was bought. A month later Sophie showed up. She apologized and swore her eternal love to her son, but he did not forgive her. That's the way it is, he kept looking at Carolyn in amazement, that's what it's all about. In the capital I managed to meet a relative of a good acquaintance. My compliments to her from the whole family, and he laughed a resounding laugh. December was cold. It was freezing, snowing, and in some windows we could already see Christmas trees. The city smelled of tangerines, and Christmas markets were open everywhere. The New Year's Eve city was transformed and sparkled with colorful lights. Carolyn was going to celebrate the New Year in the capital, and for the New Year vacations to go home, to see her parents and sisters and to bring gifts for everyone. They stood with Fiona by the Christmas tree and decorated with old toys, Carolyn remembered them when she was very young. Samuel called. He's inviting us to come over on December 31st to spend New Year's Eve with them. What do you think, do you feel like going? If only with you. I don't want to go alone. It's a family holiday, and I'd feel warmer with you. Only, Aunt Fiona, I have to buy a new dress. We will, if we have to, and she kissed her niece. In Italy, meanwhile, passions were raging. Charlotte, tapping her foot, demanded that her parents send her to Samuel. Don't you understand? He loves me, it's just that the situation is extraordinary. I'm his ex-wife's sister. That's why he's hesitant. 
I want to go to him. No, my father answered, don't you see that you don't care for him at all? He doesn't want you. How else to tell you to leave this man alone? He's had almost 20 years to think about whether he wants you or not. Don't have any illusions, but get on with your life. I hate you, hissed Charlotte. Who would doubt it? You're crazy with idleness. You should at least go work in your uncle's store. I don't want to work. You should. If I had my own money, I could buy a ticket to my Samuel, and he looked at her slyly. That's probably the only argument for going to work. Regretting that she wouldn't be spending New Year's Eve with Samuel, Charlotte decided to call him. But he was in too good a mood to listen to that squeaky voice, so he disconnected the phone, and he felt better at ease. Bastard. Won't even talk, she felt like she was about to be torn in half, I don't know what to do, she cried with helplessness. That's what I mean. And you keep thinking he's shy. When a man wants to be with a woman, there's little to stop him, and practically nothing. So be smart. How do you know nothing can stop a man? I have experience, my father smiled. Giovanni, you're talking a little too much today, my wife voiced. Look at me and my mother. She and I are in our fifth decade together. And I love her just as much as I did 46 years ago. And I love him very much, too, the daughter hugged her father and whispered in her ear. Daughter, you'll be happy without him, believe me. At the entrance to the law office hung a colorful ad, inviting employees to the New Year's corporate party. Everyone was in a great mood, everyone was getting ready for the holiday, and no one was preparing contracts. Wilmer didn't want to spoil the holiday spirit, he decided that after the New Year's break, he would take his own. Everything was new to Carolyn. A huge Christmas tree decorated the banquet hall, the pre-New Year rush was felt in everything. At the appointed day and hour in the office there were beautiful women in Christmas clothes, men in elegant suits. It was impossible to recognize some of them. The tables were full of expensive snacks and elite alcohol, Deer always celebrated New Year's Eve in a big way. He was respected for his ability to throw people a party, and never refused, if he asked to stay late at work. His principle, all work must be paid, appealed to his employees, and they never let him down. When Carolyn walked into the hall in her new blue floor-length dress, everyone said amicably, here comes the snow maiden. She was thrust into the room where Santa Claus was already dressed up. You couldn't see his face at all, his eyes were hidden by his hat and the rest by his beard. I don't know what to say, Carolyn said fearfully. Don't say anything, just stand there and smile. The voice was young, pleasant. He sounded more like not the old Frost, but the new one everyone had gathered to greet. As she stepped onto the stage for the first time, she tried to look at Santa Claus and marveled at how calm, unperturbed he seemed. She didn't know how to do that yet, so her face and ears burned treacherously, but she smiled as Santa Claus told her to. Carolyn had never been so excited. People were looking at her and discussing her outfit. Pretty girl, and the dress is great. Where on earth did the secretary of the firm get that kind of money? If she leaves, I'll be the first to take her place, the tall, dyed blonde girl muttered. And the dress really was gorgeous. It emphasized her beautiful figure, and the slit on the side allowed the most curious to look at the slender legs. Carolyn, like a fool, smiled, trying to close the cut on the dress, and had no idea what portion of envy she faced, standing on stage in this beautiful outfit. After congratulating her, Santa Claus asked her to dance, and to general applause they spun around the room. When the evening was in full swing, a tall young man came up to her and in Santa's voice asked her to dance. Is that you? The girl laughed. What do you mean? He asked, trying to play the former snow maiden. Well what do you mean, you're Santa Claus, I recognized you from your voice. There was no point in denying it. Edward, the guy introduced himself. Carolyn. May I call you Lynn? She didn't even have to act surprised, but instead covered her mouth with the palm of her hand. You're the second person who likes the name Lynn better than my full Carolyn. Who's my rival? Well, why the competition? Just a very nice man. 
the eyes of Edward standing next to her radiated warmth, and the girl was glad that she didn't have to watch her colleagues having fun on the sidelines. Lynn's eyes sparkled from Edward's attention and she was having fun, drinking champagne, but at one o'clock in the morning Aunt Fiona called. Carolyn, how are you, can I come get you? Aren't you awake? How can I sleep when you're not home? So, come over? All right, come. Are you leaving already? Yeah, it's time. I'm honestly a little tired. She saw Deer himself heading toward them. Do you know who this is, he asked Edward. Yes, we've met. Then you don't know. That's Fiona's niece. From the model house? Well, yes. You don't know who he is either, I see. He's Edward. Yes, yes, I know he's Edward. But also my son, Edward Deer is a junior. As he said, goodbye, Edward managed to ask for the girl's phone number. He clearly liked her. I'll call you, he shouted to Lynn as he drove away in the car. The snow was falling outside the window, the wind gently playing with the snowflakes, tossing them up and spinning them in a dance, then letting them fall and covering the ground with a white blanket. Carolyn lit the desk lamp, went to the window, leaned her forehead against the glass, and watched as nature prepared to welcome the new year. She looked again at her dress and mentally thanked her aunt, who in five days created such a beauty. There was not even a style, because the fabric itself was an ornament. It was also a credit to Fiona. She traveled all over the world to procure the exclusive. The girl was getting ready to go to bed, and the smile never left her face. They found the snow maiden. Standing and twirling, that's the part. And Edward is a good guy, with a sense of humor, Lynn thought, already lying in bed. Her memories were interrupted by Fiona, who entered. Her motherly gaze had a calming effect on Lynn. How was your evening? Your first ball. It was great. The tree is huge, the table is so rich, and I'm the snow maiden, can you imagine? And why not? The dress is appropriate, you're beautiful. And also, Lynn, just call me Fiona. That way you and I will be even closer. Our next ball is at Davis. There's something big coming up. And then you and I are going home together. I miss my brothers and sisters, too. We should get together, and New Year's is a good occasion for that. Come in, Samuel said as he opened the door and invited me in. The festive mood was felt as soon as they pulled up to the house. Right in front of the house, a huge blue Christmas tree was decked out with toys and colorful lights. On the other side of the house was a huge slide poured. Oh. It's really going to be fun, said Lynn, laughing. You like it? asked Samuel, even though he knew the answer beforehand. It couldn't help but like it. People had already gathered in the living room, each group divided by interest, but almost everyone came up to Fiona. They congratulated her and, hugging her, wished her the best for the coming year. For some reason there are no friends, the girl said sadly. You know how it is. You're healthy, young, full of hopes and plans. You're admired, there are a lot of friends around you. You're in demand, popular. And suddenly, all of a sudden, no one wants you. And it's not even because you're suddenly blind, it's because you've found new, healthy friends. That's one. But, unfortunately, even at such a cost, he learned who was a friend and who was nothing, Fiona explained, holding her niece's hand. I'm sure Austin will find the strength to go back to a normal life. It's hard, of course, but he has no other way. That's right, girl. There he is standing on the stairs. Go congratulate him and help him down. Samuel came out of the study and started inviting everyone to the table to see off the old year. Carolyn kept glancing at him and he kept glancing at his watch. Is Samuel waiting for someone? Keeps looking at his watch, Fiona remarked. I thought so, too. But the guests began to make toasts, each thanking the outgoing year for something. But one thing everyone agreed on was that they were letting the year go with gratitude for all the good things. 
Near midnight, the doorbell rang, and Samuel jumped right out of his seat and went to open it. He walked in hand in hand with a beautiful, slender woman, pulling off her coat as he went. A blonde woman with huge brown eyes, wearing a beautiful dress that accentuated all her charms, walked straight to the table and took a seat next to Samuel. Friends, attention, please, this is Camilla. Smiling cheerfully, she nodded happily to everyone, thus showing that she was pleased by this attention and that if they were friends of Samuel, she didn't mind being her friends, too. She's pretty, Fiona said, looking at the new guest. And I honestly don't like it. And if I don't like someone, maybe we should go home, Lynn said sadly. Fiona didn't keep quiet. I remember you telling me that you weren't right for him. He needs a woman in his social circle, beautiful, elegant. Consider him listening to you. You're not his, and he's not yours. Don't disappoint me and don't ruin people's New Year's mood. You're not a child anymore. I'm sorry. I realize I'm an idiot. Here's where I agree with you. Five minutes before New Year's Eve, Samuel asked everyone to grab their champagne glasses and go outside. As the chimes began to count down the last minutes of the outgoing year, the fireworks began. The clinking of crystal glasses was heard, everyone was hugging, and as she looked over at Samuel, Lynn saw him kissing Camilla. She swallowed her saliva and turned away. Austin stood beside her, wishing her a happy new year and wishing her happiness. Then the grown-up uncles and aunts rolled down the slide and cheered like children. Lynn and Austin went for a ride together, too. When everyone went inside and started dancing, Lynn asked her aunt to go home. Let's go, it's four o'clock in the morning. I'm kind of tired. Just don't say anything to Samuel, I'll just say goodbye to Austin. Can you stay a little longer? The young man asked. No, Austin, Auntie is tired and wants to go home, so we'll go. Tell Daddy thank you for such a lovely evening, and after kissing him on the cheek, she ran to the car. Fiona looked at her hushed niece. What do you think? What can I say, they're a beautiful couple, as much as I'd like to. She suits him better than I do. I wonder how old she is. She's 32 years old. There, and the age is right. She owns a beauty salon. It's noticeable. Fabulously groomed. Not like me. Silly, you're so pretty you don't need any grooming. Believe me. But she suits him and you've got to get over it. How do you know all about her? Some of the guests know her. And stop worrying about losing a man you never belong to. You have my word that this is the last time we talk about Samuel. I'll get over it. Good girl. That's the way I like you better and you remind me of your father. They smiled at each other and Carolyn, leaning against Fiona's shoulder, fell asleep. It was five o'clock in the morning when Carolyn reached her pillow. But sleep was as good as gone, because it hurt, it hurt a lot. And there was no way she could get rid of it. Even with her poor imagination she imagined Samuel with Camilla. She was ashamed of such frank thoughts, but there was no way she could get rid of the image of Samuel, kissing this beautiful woman. That's right, Auntie said, I'm not his, and he's not mine. We're kind of close, but we're not together. Never have been and definitely won't be anymore. Lynn was having this endless conversation with herself. She asked, reasoned, and answered her own questions. She never thought it would hurt her so much. Though Samuel had never given her any reason to think there might be anything between them. Well, didn't he notice my looks, my size? Isn't he an experienced man and knows how a woman who likes a man behaves, Lynn mentally asked someone. But she had to answer her own questions. How a woman behaves, of course, he knows, but a 17-year-old girl probably doesn't. She still lay there for so long before her eyelids grew heavy and she slipped into a New Year's Eve dream in which she rode Samuel on a slide and danced a slow dance to magical music. His hot palms rested on her waist and she melted in his embrace. She awoke to the delicious smell of freshly brewed coffee and vanilla in time for dinner. The next day they left for their homeland, having packed groceries and gifts with them.
the hometown greeted them with frost and snow-covered roads. The fence still stretched to the left, only now it was brown instead of green. But it still had writing on it, teenage matting, hearts, and drawings. It was all a sign of her former life, which had become a complete stranger to her. The car drove along the fence, but Lynn didn't look at it anymore. It was as if there was no life here, nothing had changed in a year, only her father had aged, seeing him in front of the car. She jumped out and threw herself into her father's arms. Her cozy little world was now narrowed for her to the size of her parents' house and their embrace. The house was warm and cozy. The music of the 70s played softly, the Christmas tree was in its former place, and the sisters were quiet, afraid to come near their older sister. Everything changed when Carolyn began to give presents and Fiona took out groceries. My parents sat on the couch, watching the gift-giving commotion. Mom wiped away her tears, and Dad squinted slyly and called for order. By dinnertime, all the relatives had pulled up, and Carolyn immediately felt at home and realized how much she missed everyone. Carolyn's last night at her parents' house was unsettling. She was aware that she would not be able to see her dear ones again for a long time. They had lived together for 17 years, sharing joys and sorrows, and now she must get used to living apart from them. Aunt Fiona, of course, brightened her loneliness and was the little bridge that connected her to her home. My father said, Goodbye. If you don't get in this year, there's nothing more for you to do in the capital. Come home, get into technical school, and help your mother. I'll get in, Dad. I'll get in, don't even doubt it. You understand, it's hard to give up everything you've dreamed of. I want to get everything I'm owed. After all, I didn't get a gold medal for nothing. Don't worry, Gregory, Fiona interceded for her niece, such a daughter to be proud of. Not a day idle, earned money, helped me. You brought her up well, she will do well. The father hugged his sister. Thank you, Fiona, for my daughter. I have peace of mind that she's not hanging around rented apartments, but that she's living in good conditions. She's homely, and everyone saw tears in this seemingly stern man's eyes. Carolyn ducked into her father's neck and looked up at him with eyes full of happiness and said, I love you, don't worry about me, Aunt Fiona is with me. The car drove away from the house, and my parents stood looking after me. Carolyn only turned away when they were out of sight. It's good to have you, she said, hugging Fiona. And I have you, she replied. No sooner had they entered the apartment than Lynn's phone rang. Lynn, where did you disappear to, asked Austin cheerfully. Immediately the picture of Samuel and Camilla came to mind. I'm not missing. Why aren't you coming? Look, Austin, I have other things to do, my personal life after all. I'm sorry I ruined your mood. I understand, you don't have to. Exactly, Lynn replied and cried. That's no good, honey. What does this guy have to do with anything? He didn't even see that kiss or Camilla at all. You need to learn to separate the personal from your work and your friendships. Austin is a good guy, he's attached to you, you said yourself he has no friends. No unequivocally you disappoint me, Fiona said grudgingly. I'll call him tomorrow and ask for an apology. But not to do that, you have to think with your head. Calling Austin was embarrassing to her. Indeed, it wasn't his fault that his father had chosen Camilla over her. But it was on him that she vented her resentment and even anger, though the latter was hard for her to admit. Lynn still knew Austin too poorly to speculate on whether or not he would call again. Of course he was upset, resentful. But he was so proper, restrained, calm. He knew how to control his emotions, something she could have learned from him. She called him a week later, but he didn't answer. She kept calling every day, but the result was the same. Lynn stood in front of the gate of the mansion, and she was afraid to press the bell. Why did you come then, an inner voice asked. And she pressed the dare. Lynn was ready to see anyone but Susan. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Camilla was familiar with the girl's face, but she couldn't remember where she'd seen her. Do we know each other, she asked. My aunt and I were visiting Samuel on New Year's Day. 
Ah. I remember. And what did you want? I wanted to see Austin. I worked for him for a while as a nurse. We became friends. The woman's crooked smile threw Carolyn off balance. The girl felt humiliated, but she didn't want to be humiliated at all. Nothing reflected on her face, and Lynn said, I'm sorry. I probably came for nothing. Hi Austin. He's not here, Camilla said already in pursuit, Samuel left with him for surgery, and she slammed the door. Two years passed. Lynn was in her second year of law school as a part-time student. She didn't want to quit her job, she was used to her money and wanted to manage it herself. She had left secretarial work long ago and was working as a paralegal. She loved the job. New people, new situations, and, therefore, new knowledge, she did the right thing by choosing to study by correspondence. For two years they had been dating Edward, but she hadn't lost touch with Austin. She knew that the operation had been a success, but his eyesight had not yet fully returned. He wore glasses, which suited him fine. Austin had matured, had recovered, and looked much more confident than before. He was a handsome young man. Edward persisted in courting, calling, and Carolyn gave in. After a year of acquaintance, he offered to live together. Move in with me. I have a nice one-bedroom apartment downtown. We don't see each other that often. Is that a marriage proposal? It seemed to her that after these words, he seemed to fidget and answered quickly, Not yet. We have to see if we're right for each other. I don't think we're right for each other, Carolyn said, if a man has a desire to see each other, he'll always find an opportunity. So, it's purely an excuse. That's not true, began to defend himself zealously, Edward. Don't yell like that and don't raise your voice at me. I think if you don't want to marry me, put a ring on this finger here, it shows you're not interested. So you don't really care that much about the issue. Oh, how clever you've become. It's hard with you. Edward, I'm not keeping anyone. You're a success with women, so it will be easy to find a replacement for me. And she quickly opened the door to the entryway and ran to the apartment. All evening Lynn replayed the conversation with the young man. We're so different, the girl thought, he's always drawn to partying, and I'm not thrilled about it. In the most expensive club he feels in his element. It's torture for me. Too loud, too many people, too crowded and too many drunks. Clubs will never be on my entertainment list. She really didn't care for them. There was plenty to see in the capital without the clubs. As soon as they entered a club, the girls straightened their backs, straightened their hair, and looked him devotedly in the eye. He gave off such energy, such a discharge of testosterone, that it acted like a magnet. His popularity alarmed and frightened her. Carolyn lay on her aunt's shoulder and shared her fears. You reason right, girl. But you must consider one more important detail. If he does convince you, and you start living together in an informal marriage, you must be prepared to accept all his faults. Otherwise you will be disappointed. You are a lawyer and you understand that what some people call a common law marriage is cohabitation. And he will always consider himself free in this cohabitation, and you will have no rights. I can't forbid you, but I can warn you. It's up to you, my dear. But I wouldn't be in a hurry. Remember my story and let it be a good lesson to you. I understand everything, auntie, you say right. Do you love him? I like him. But social status and childhood experiences alienate us from each other. Lynn actually underestimated herself. She had long ago acquired the luster of a metropolitan girl, dressed well, excelled in school, was successful. Another thing was that she was still a kind and naive girl who believed in goodness and good people. Samuel's passions were boiling, too. After that New Year's Eve meeting where he introduced Camilla to his friends, she stayed at his house. Her relationship with Sandra, who worked as a cook for Samuel, did not work out right away. She demanded some special food to keep her in shape. Sandra was an excellent cook. She had once been a chef in a restaurant in the capital. Because of a conflict with the owner she was out of a job. 
that's when she came to Samuel's house with a recommendation from his best friend who had moved to another city. In so many years of work she became a member of the family, loved Austin, treated Samuel's first wife well. Loretta in general was loved by everyone. When he brought her to meet her parents, they welcomed her immediately. Get married, son, beautiful woman, my father said at the time. Her mother looked her in the eye until the girl was embarrassed. You will see nothing but love for your son in my eyes. That is good. If you love our son, you are always welcome in our home. And I will be glad to have a daughter in your person. But when Samuel brought Camilla to meet her parents, somehow they were not inspired by the future kinship. Sitting at the table, Samuel said he was leaving soon with Austin for surgery, a call came in from the ophthalmology department. While Mary was showing Camilla the house, Harold's father called his son to the balcony to talk. I don't like her, son. Not sincere, artificial somehow. She just worries, wants you to like her, that's why she's so unnatural. I never told you about my method? He saw his son's eyebrows go up. What kind of beast is that? Give her carte blanche. Warn everyone before you leave that this is the future mistress of your house, to comply with all her requests. Everyone. And what is the essence of this method? When a man is sure of his position, gets a lot of power, he allows himself a lot. But how much, you'll find out when you get back. Why are you so surprised? This method helped two friends of mine. They got rid of bitches, like God forbid. Who's that? Robert you know, our neighbor, and the other one is his friend. Learned a lot about their future wives. Do as I ask you. Samuel reluctantly nodded and promised to think about it. Sure, Camilla was cranky, demanding a lot of attention, but that was normal. The woman in the house was not a piece of furniture, but a living person, but after thinking about it, he still did as his father had asked. Gathering all the workers before he left, he said, We are leaving with Austin to another country, I will be gone a month or more. Remains for the mistress Camilla, as my future wife, all noticed how the woman's shoulders straightened and eyes sparkled, obey her and do all her requests. Understand? No one answered anything. Everyone knew that the terrible days would soon begin. But what exactly could Camilla be expected to do? No one could have imagined how cruel and deceitful she would be. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.